Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the Wednesday night lectureships. Uh, my name is Jason Isbell and I've been asked to lead us all in a period of congregational singing uh, until about 6.45 or so. So if you will, grab a songbook and join me in turning first to number nine. We'll be using our books for the next few minutes, just going from one song to the next. <clears throat> First song will be number nine. Let us sing. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and guards me there with his hand. Let us sing. Yeah. 
Let's sing together number 581. Number 581.
We're glad that you're here this evening for the Wednesday night service of the lectureship and here the final keynote lesson of the week. We've had a great, great week. So many opportunities for good, so many lessons delivered from a number of experienced gospel preachers and teachers, and we've really enjoyed what we've been subject to this week. But we're, we're going to be having a treat in store for us this evening. Uh, leading our singing will be Jason Isbell. Our opening prayer will be led by Jimmy G. Closing prayer by Brother Fender Northern. And at the proper time, Sam Long, Sam Long will introduce our speaker for tonight. Good evening. Our first song tonight will be number 200. Let us sing. Hallelujah. Praise you.
Let us pray. Our Holy Father in heaven, may your name be glorified in all the earth. May we live in such a way as to do that every day. Father, we are thankful for Jesus, the fact that he was willing to come to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. Father, we thank you for being willing to send him. We thank you for the fact that he was willing to come. And we thank you that he was raised from the dead. Father, I ask you to forgive us of our sins. Help us always to have a penitent heart, a penitent attitude. Father, we thank you for this congregation here and all the good that it does. We thank you for her elders, her ministers, her deacons. We pray your blessings upon each one. We thank you for the lectureship this week and all the great lessons that have been given. We thank you for those that presented them and that you would bless each one of them also. Father, we pray for those that are sick. We pray for those that have lost loved ones. May you give to them each and everything they need according to your will. We thank you for Wissam and his efforts to reach the Muslim world. We pray that your gospel will go forth through him. And may we seek to reach out in our own ways with your message. We ask you to go with us and keep us safe. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Before Brother Sam comes up and introduces tonight's speaker, let's sing together number 345, It Is Well With My Soul. Would you please stand? <clears throat> Let us sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way.
Amen. Wow, what good singing tonight. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight, Wissam al Ithoi. Ithoi. And I did something I usually try to do and probably messed the name up, but I went online to see how other people had introduced you. And I listened to seven lessons that you had given online. And those that introduced you said, our speaker tonight, and never admit your name at all, not one time. <laughs> but we're glad that you're here. His subject tonight is God is near. He has been here on campus all day. He spoke in chapel, and I think the attendance of our uh, college students kind of tell you just what good job you did because they came back. He spoke uh, for about almost three hours over in the small chapel and uh, again answering questions and hearing uh, from others and just fantastic information. He was raised in Iraq as a Muslim, uh, turned to atheism, then by the grace of God discovered the gospel became a Christian and finally an evangelist in trying to convert Muslims. He was baptized at the age of 12. Took, or at, at the, uh, took him 12 years to find somebody to baptize him. But I am glad that they did, and I'm glad he's here tonight. I know you'll enjoy what we're saying. We'll have to say. Good evening. My name is not the only thing that they could not get right, even the name of the faith that I came from. One time I was introduced in a uh, rural uh, congregation in Texas, and the preacher said, well, this gentleman is a convert from Muslim. Uh, he used to be a former Islam. Uh, is available in chapter 4, or in part 4 of Islam in Christ's eyes. The full version is in, I am an Arab, and I'm a Christian. The Christian philosopher Peter Kreef once wrote that there are three things that we all need. Things that we know that we absolutely need and look for. And these three things, which he calls the three transcendentals, are in the order of their importance, Truth first, and then goodness, and then beauty. He said this is the order in which these three transcendentals exist in nature. But he said that the way we usually respond to those is the exact opposite order. So what catches our attention first is not the truth, it is not the goodness, it is the beauty, and then we want the truth, and then we want uh, the goodness, and then we want the truth. Interestingly enough, this is the exact order in which I converted out of my family's faith of Sunni Islam into atheism before I became a Christian. We've been, com we've been trying to figure out ways to communicate the truth of the gospel to our non-Christian neighbors for the past 2,000 years since the Christian faith started. And yet, the truth of the matter is that people are not in, uh, inherently truth seekers. They are not interested in what is true. They want something that is cool, something that is beautiful and good. On April 1st, 2011, a Turkish 737 like this one landed at the JFK airport, having people from Turkey, some European countries, and one man from Iraq that was about to experience a radical change in his life. A few days before that, I had quit my job as a san sanitary engineer after I worked for eight years, came to this nation with one bag after I said my final goodbyes to my family. And I had one contact here, a poor woman in the Amish country of Pennsylvania. 
The planned part of the journey was a one-week tour in New York City. I was admitted as a visitor. The unplanned part was everything else. I just came to this nation to feel dignity and to be free, especially free to worship the God I believe in the way I believe is true. Within a few months, I met over a thousand people who rushed to call me a brother. And God took care of my needs in the months of insecurity and uncertainties in the Amish country until I started to get paid to go to school to study the book I had a secret love affair with back in Baghdad at the time when I ran out of the last dollar. My name is Wissam. I am 39. I was born in 1979 in Baghdad. A few months after I was born, Saddam Hussein became our president, and Ayatollah Khomeini led the Islamic Revolution in the neighboring Iran. The war between the two countries started a few months later to last for eight years. That was my childhood. I was born and raised in a war zone, a classic example of a whole community that was not told to love one another. A community that was not built on the word of God and in the goodness and the love of Jesus Christ. The war ended in 1998, uh, uh, two years after which Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. We had the sanctions that lasted for 13 years in which my whole family lived on $1 a month. And we had the Gulf War of 1991. Now, up until that point, Saddam Hussein was not a religious person. He was a secular, uh, socialist, military dictator obsessed with figures like Stalin and Hitler. In fact, he put to death most of the religious leaderships of the predominantly Shiite Muslim Iraqi community when he first came to power. But right after the Gulf War, there was a Shiite revolt against him in the south. Tens of thousands of Shiites revolted against him. And he figured out, he found out, that he could not impose a secular system on the predominantly Muslim people of Iraq. So after he crushed that revolt, killing tens of thousands of his people, he started to put on a show of Islam, wrote Allahu Akbar on the Iraqi flag, ordered the Quran to be taught in all the Iraqi schools, launched what he called the faith campaign, built hundreds of mosques, and he started to turn the Iraqi community from being secular to being more Islamic. My father retired in 1992 and pretty much did not do ever, anything ever since. My mom, a self-sacrificing, hard-working woman, started working as a seamstress, mending the clothes of, of our neighborhood to provide for me and my family in the Iraqi version of the Great Depression. When I was in the middle of my teenage years, in the middle of the 1990s, it was pretty obvious that Iraq was at enmity with every other country in the world. Because of the pan-Arab nationalist culture of our government and because of Islam, we did not have the terrorism that is ravaging the Middle East now. We did not have ISIS or Al-Qaeda or the car bombs or the beheading. But all of that was being preached in mosques, was being taught in schools, was being talked about by the government in their limited channels. Iraq was a total prison. We had two government-run TV channels, three government newspapers, two government radio stations, and that's it. The internet, the cell phones, satellite channels already common in all the other countries around Iraq were banned, and the government only told us what they wanted us to know. And hatred was preached every day against you when I did not want to hate you. And folks, hate is evil, whether it is in Iraq against you or whether it is here against my own people. It is so ironic that it was hate that caused me to eventually forsake my family's faith of Islam and leave Iraq all the way to come to the United States only to read the comment section, the comment section on the news media and see what they are talking about my own family members. You could feel that there was a whole thing that was brewing up, bubbling up. Uh, we did not have wars, but you could feel that there was a war that was coming, and I decided not to be a part of any culture that preached hatred. Like every Iraqi, I had that vacuum inside of me. Something did not make sense. Something did not click. 
unlike the religious, the devout religious people of Iraq, I was not distracted from that vacuum. If you are a devout Muslim, you would be distracted praying five times a day, fasting every Ramadan, reading the Quran without bothering to know what the Quran actually tells you. We did not starve in all fairness. We did not starve for food or water because of the sanctions years. We had a socialist government that provided us with our basic needs almost for free. But we were starving for a different kind of bread and a different kind of water that we did not even know. My four-year-old sister passed away in 1996. My mom, a panicked mother in the funeral of her daughter, was begging for someone to give her a glimpse of hope that that innocent child went to heaven. No one was able to provide her with that hope, and the only man who was knowledgeable in the Quran in the funeral told her she will be judged for the very first breath she took in when she was born. That's when I started to think, what kind of God is that? A few months later, my uncle got cancer. He was the uncle that I loved most. He was very kind and very humorous and very generous. But he would not answer my questions when I talked with him when he was in his deathbed. And he would cry every time I talked with him. He was so sad, not only because he saw his death coming, which he did in a few days, but because for the first time in his life, he was unable to go to the bathroom, to get ritually clean, to do the prayers every Muslim is required to do five times a day. He was in bed soiling himself. He thought God was done with him, and he died without hope. That's when I decided that's it between me and God. Rejected Islam, became an atheist, continued to put on a show of Islam for the rest of my stay in Iraq. I thought I would be happy if I were an atheist. Imagine a world where there is no God. Imagine a, a system where you can do whatever you want with no consequences. If the only assurance that the Quran gives is hellfire, then what's the point of piety and the, 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 the religious uh, commitment? But somewhere deep inside me, I was not happy. I was looking for justice. I was looking for direction. And I tried to entertain and distract myself and fill that vacuum that was inside of me, looking for something that is beautiful, something that is cool. I learned English. I started listening to music and watching movies and reading books. And most of the books that I read and the movies that I watched quoted the Bible. Now, a Muslim believes that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Muslims have no issue with the inspiration of the Bible. They just teach that the Bible that we have today is not the same Bible that was originally inspired. The original Bible was lost and the current Bible is totally made up. I was not religious anyway, so I did not care. But those books continued to quote the Bible. In fact, it was when I was in my second year in college that the first Mission Impossible movie was released. Tom Cruise picked the Gideon's Bible and read Job 3.14. That was the first time I ever see the Bible. I got so curious to get myself a copy of the Bible only to understand what those books and those movies were saying. So I went to a flea market in Baghdad and bought my first Bible which was the Gospel of John. I thought that was the entire Bible. I did not find Job 3.14 in the Gospel of John, and that reinforced the Muslim stereotype that everybody is making up a different Bible. I mean, who is John anyway? <laughs> Something caught my attention, though, in the Gospel of John. The way Jesus addressed the hypocritical religious authorities of his time, calling them liars. Something you're not supposed to do in a Muslim community. I was raised by two devout Muslim parents. They are not evil. They are just Muslims. They are not saved. And they taught me that every imam is a steward of God's word, and you should not be questioning them. Well, not this Jesus. This was the first time I read about a religious man uh, uh, attacking religious authorities in a religious book. I have identified myself as a rebel all the time, and I, and I thought Jesus was cool in this book, which I did not care whether it was true or not. Did not care, though. Threw the gospel away. Finished my second year in college. And in the summer holiday between the second and the third year, I was back in that same flea market flipping the New Testament. 
I saw the Gospel of John in the New Testament. That was the first time I learned that the Gospel of John was not another Bible, as Muslims claim. It was part of a bigger book, so I bought the New Testament. Few days later, I realized that the New Testament was part of another bigger book. I ran out of money. I borrowed money from my cousin and bought my first complete Bible. The beauty of the Bible caught my attention first. The Bible is the most influential piece of literature that was ever written. Every story, movie, song, fairy tale is inspired at least indirectly by the Bible. Thomas Foster, the author of How to Read Literature Like a Professor, does not ever claim to be a Christian, and he's the one who said that. And then I started to fall in love with the goodness of the Bible, a book that preached love and not hatred, forgiveness and not vengeance, a book that preached integrity, uh, uh, benevolence, uh, uh, truth and not deception, you name it. And I was especially shocked by the historical and geographic information in the Bible, common knowledge where I came from. Babylon, that's 50 miles to the south of my parents' house. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, these are the native Iraqis. Nebuchadnezzar, his poster is next to Saddam Hussein's picture in every street corner in Iraq. The captivity, the pride of the Iraqi history that we studied in the seventh grade. And I was thinking, man, the guy who made up this book really knew his history and geography. <laughs> I had so many questions about the book that I already started to fall in love with, but I did not have any friends in my by now all Muslim neighborhood. But when the third year started, third year of college, I saw a man with a big cross on his shirt. He obviously flunked to the third year. I went to him. I asked him, sir, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I am. I said, I got myself a copy of the Bible, and I have a few questions. Are you a devout Christian? Do you know your Bible? He said, go ahead. I said, do you Christians believe that you are saved by God's grace or by your obedience? Yeah, I read Romans. He took me, just like every other preacher, he did not directly answer my question. But he took the opportunity to introduce the gospel message to me. He took me aside and he explained to me uh, how God is a, a just and holy God who does not tolerate sin, but at the same time, he's a loving God, so he sent his son to take our sins on him and die on the cross for us. It's a combination of God's grace and our obedience. I said, okay, I have one more question. Do you really believe that? I mean... I know that the most educated part of the world is too smart to believe in a made-up book. But do you really believe? Are you a Christian because you believe in the Bible, or do you just do that to spite us Muslims? Because we've been raised and we've been taught to, to, to believe that there is no person in his or her right mind uh, that believes in the Bible. Do you believe in the Bible? He said, oh, yeah, we do. Next day, he brought me some literature that talked about how many tens of thousands of mining scripts of the Bible we have today in the museums from different times, from different places, in different languages, and they all match each other. There is no way the Islam claim that the Bible was corrupt is true. And I was so happy to learn that the book that has the solution to every problem my community is suffering from is true. I was so happy to discover that the book that was both beautiful and good turned out to be true. I thought everybody else would be as happy. I was wrong. <laughs> you know, it is unthinkable to convert out of Islam, especially in the community that I came from. Not much, not so in the United States. The first person I tried to share the gospel with was the woman that I love, that I love most. That woman that gave all that she had and all that she is. For me, knowing that on one day I would probably leave her for good. My mom used to wake up before me to make breakfast for me every morning, even to the very last morning before I came here in 2011. And she would not answer me when I say good morning, mom, at that time. One morning, I said, mom, what's wrong? She turned to me with tears on her cheeks. And she grabbed me by the collar. And she said, please tell me, what did I fail to provide for you that you do this thing to me. I said, what thing? 
She said, I've been working day and night to make a human being out of you. I've been wearing my eyes out on that sewing machine to send you to school, and you've been using my money to buy that blasphemous book too, that I have been seeing among your college books. Look at yourselves. Grow up. With that, with the lack of encouragement, the lack of wisdom, with the fact that I started to lose many of my Muslim friends and not gain new Christian friends, with the fact that I started to get harassed by the religious authorities in my neighborhood, I came to a point where I thought, maybe this was all wrong. Maybe there is no God. Maybe the gospel was just another philosophy that I wanted to entertain myself with. And I renounced the Christian faith and gave away my Bible. Only a few months later, I realized that the hope and the satisfaction and the fulfillment and the assurance that I had when I claimed God's promises as my own would not be replaced with any security in this life. I'd rather be a persecuted Christian with hope than a comfortable non-Christian with no hope. So I got a new copy of the Bible in English this time, so my mom would not understand it. And I continued to read the Bible in secret for the rest of my stay in Iraq. My biggest discouragement was that it would take me 12 years going to every single church building in Baghdad trying to get baptized in vain. So I finished school in 2000, finished my mandatory military service in 2002, was employed as a sanitary engineer. The American Army came in 2003. For the first time, we started to have the internet and cell phones, and, 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 and we started to be open to the rest of the world. Uh, I downloaded the sermons and Christian songs, uploaded them to my MP3 player. I would listen to them every morning uh, in my, day, uh, in my uh, way to work. In fact, eSword was the second thing I ever downloaded from the internet, and everything continued to have the same tone to it until that one morning in October of 2009 when I was working for the nine stories 1,500 employees, Iraqi Department of Public Work, making a phone call when a truck bomb rocked that building and a second truck bomb, that was, a, that was supposed to be a video, and a second truck bomb rocked a second building a few hundred feet away. 1,500 people got killed or injured in these two explosions. I came out of it without a scratch. I was in the staircase. We moved to a substitute building in another neighborhood in Baghdad, and that building had an internet cafe next to it. I used to go to that cyber cafe to, to check my email every afternoon after work. I had to pay a flat rate to use the internet for an hour. Didn't take me more than a few minutes to see my email, after which I would be Googling, looking up, uh, uh, up things on the internet. Uh, and I randomly Googled a free Bible study and signed up for the first hit, which, by the way, did not look like that back then, because later on, I translated that website into Arabic. And I took a picture of it's uh, uh, author baptizing his daughter with my own cell phone camera, but that's for later. A woman was assigned to grade my Bible test, and she asked me in her first email, the time now is April 2010, she asked me if I had any prayer requests. I said, yeah, sure, prayer requests. I've been a believer for 12 years, and I've been trying to get baptized, and this is Baghdad, where we don't exactly have a baptistry in every street corner. So would you please pray that I can be baptized? And would you please pray that I can live in a Christian-friendly community where I can say Jesus is Lord without getting killed right on the spot? That same day, I found a free Christian book called Bible Basics, written by a British missionary called Duncan Heaster, who had a ministry in Latvia. I placed an order uh, of that book, gave my mailing address. He answered me with an automatic email introducing himself and his ministry, and he said, and I believe that if you want to become a Christian, you need to be immersed in water, and if you're not baptized, I can baptize you. I emailed him back, thank you, sir, but I'm from Iraq. Read the address. He said, I'm coming to Iraq and baptizing you. And on May 26, 2010, he came all the way from Latvia to northern Iraq, paid for my bus ticket to go from Baghdad to northern Iraq and baptized me in a bathroom. The woman that was grading my Bible tests used to be a caregiver for a quadriplegic man in a Christian man's house in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. And she told the owner of the house about me, who told her, 
tell that Iraqi, if he plans to come to the United States, he can stay with me indefinitely for free, and I'm going to help him establish his life. A few weeks later, the American embassy in Baghdad started issuing personal visas for Iraqis for the first time in 20 years since the Gulf War. So I quit my job, applied for the visa, bought the plane ticket, packed my bag, flew all the way from Baghdad to New York City, took the bus from Port Authority in Times Square to Reading, Pennsylvania, where that woman and the Christian man were waiting for me. And they took me to stay with them in Boyertown, Pennsylvania. The money that I brought with me was getting less. Uh, I was, for the first time, I came from the 7 million people metropolis of Baghdad, and suddenly I'm in the woods of the Amish country of Pennsylvania. It was so depressing. <laughs> the government did not immediately answer my asylum application. I did not have a driver's license. I could not take the bus or the train to go anywhere. Until that time when we had a singing event, by the way, on the other hand, that was the most spiritually refreshing part of my life. We almost had a Bible study and a singing event every day. And in one of those singing events, I met the first member of the Lord's Church, uh, uh, a man by the name Ivan Martin, who called me and asked me, young man, come over here. What brought you all the way from Baghdad to the Amish country? And he would be the first person that ever hears the story that you're listening to this evening. He said, man, you need to share that with my church. I said, sir, only a few months ago, I could not even go to church without raising unnecessary suspicions. He said, you need to, to, to testify to what Jesus has been doing in your life. And he had me speaking in a, a Sunday morning service in his church, the Camp Hill Church of Christ in Pennsylvania, the preacher of which happened to be a graduate of the school that I eventually ended up going to. He said, you need to go to a Bible school. And he started raising support money for me before he could pronounce my last name. And before I knew it, I was in the front of the school chapel in January of 2012 with the dean of the school asking me about my plans after I graduate. I said, what plans? How did I end up here? And then I remembered that every night for years back in my hometown, I used to pray fervently to God to be able to do what you're doing now just to have the freedom and the comfort and the luxury of going to church, worshiping him, studying his word, singing his praises, praying, fellowshipping with the other believers, and in turn, I'm going to serve him for the rest of my life. I said, I plan to take the gospel to the Muslim communities in the United States. I finished school, and one of our teachers who's from Rochester, Michigan, his name is Jerry Tolman, connected me with the congregations up in the Detroit area. Ever since, I've been an associate minister working with the Sunset Church of Christ uh, in Taylor, Michigan, preaching the gospel to the uh, predominantly Muslim community in the neighboring Dearborn, Michigan. I have spoken in over 100 congregations in over thir in all, in, in 30 states and Washington, D.C., uh, and a few universities. And I'm so glad that Alabama is my 30th state and that Faulkner is my sixth Christian school that I spoke at. I wrote two books. Uh, my ministry now is both local and global. Eight years ago, I used to hide my faith to stay alive. Today, I share my faith to make a living. Look at me deep in the eye and tell me there is no God. I would like to conclude with this shorter story that happened in November of 2004. I was working for the Iraqi Department of Public Works when I was assigned to go with another engineer to a city that was 40 miles to the west of Baghdad, the biggest county in Iraq, a city by the name Fallujah. The American army had just retaken that city from Al-Qaeda. And we were told to go there and restore the basic services, water and sewage. We met with two local engineers in Fallujah. We used our measuring tapes and leveling devices to pick a piece of land that would be the next Fallujah water department. We had lunch in one of the few surviving shish kebab restaurants. 
and we were on our way to a sewerage lifting station to assess the damages on, on the lifting station when we were stuck in a traffic jam. Traffic jam. The city looks empty. The whole scene looks like a, a post-apocalyptic movie. Where did this traffic jam come from? They said, beat us. It was a traffic jam made by an American Army checkpoint specifically for us. The American soldiers told us to drive into an abandoned alleyway, open the doors, put your hands in the air, and put your face on the wall. The American soldier pointed his rifle to the back of my head. That's when we knew that when they saw us taking measurements to that piece of land, they thought we were terrorists planning for a mortar attack. I had my papers and my books, and I had my hands up looking at an ugly concrete block wall, knowing that this would be the final scene I ever see in my life, and that in a few seconds I will meet a just God who will not be pleased with most of what I did in my life. And I only had one thought in my mind. Remember the date, 2004. That was six years after I believed, six years before I got to be baptized. Lord, I tried. I said to the soldier, sir, please, my hand is tired. Can I lower it? He said, do you speak English? <laughs> a couple of minutes and a couple of radio calls later, he, or they apologized to us and let us go. The point is, I literally saw death with my eyes, and I only had that one thought. The Bible, as I understood it, without any influence, tells us that you are saved by God's grace and by the gospel of Jesus Christ in baptism. It is not hard if you have never heard the gospel twisted by any false teacher before in your life to know this simple truth and this simple fact. And it took me 12 years before God sent that British man who contacted me this morning, by the way. Uh, I, th I think it's very ironic. And so the point is, we live now in a nation that does not only permit you to practice your Christian faith, not only support the Christian faith, but celebrates the Christian faith. The Bible teaches us about our sin and the reward of sin, and it teaches us the way of salvation. The Bible also says that there are a lot of reasons for teachers to be false teachers. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6 that if anyone teaches any other thing than the wholesome words of Jesus Christ, he's proud, knowing nothing, is obsessed with sophistry, men of corrupt mind who think that godliness is a means for gain. Five motives that cause people to lead millions of and millions of people into a false security and eventually into an eternal punishment. And so my message is, just make sure if you have found God, if you have sensed that God is near, and you wanted to make a conscious decision to walk with him, to experience his presence in this life, and to be rewarded eternally, and have not been baptized yet, Please do so as soon as you can. It, it's been such an honor and a pleasure spending these past couple of days with you, and I'm so looking forward to be uh, in touch with you all the time, and thank you, and may God bless all of you on this evening.
I told you it was powerful. And if you haven't gotten to know Wissam, you need to do that. Of course, I think all of us think we know him now. It's much, much better since we've heard him. But if you talk to him one-on-one, you'll learn more about him. He has his books that he mentioned with, with him, and it's in the foyer if you're interested. His book, I Am an Arab and I Am a Christian, also the book, uh, Islam Through Christ's Eyes. As I've mentioned before, I've read both of those books. I have them myself, and I highly recommend them. If you don't have them, you need to get them. They're worth every penny that you pay for them. Also, I'd like to mention, before I forget it, there is a car, a Champagne Sonata, which has the tag 3AB3403. Your lights are on. They may, by this point, be off. <laughs> so there we go. He's checking his lights. All right. One more thing, too. Someone left a pair of glasses. Somebody asked me, where is the lost and found? I said, you're looking at him. I'm lost and found. <laughs> this pair of glasses is sitting up here on the, on the podium in case they're yours. Feel free to come and pick them up. Uh, the men's spring schedule, this is for the university church, for the prison ministry is now available. There's also a special announcement for those here at university. Mary McAndrews passed away this morning in Texas at her daughter's. And the arrangements are to be announced later. So please make note of that. We are going to, in just a moment, I have some gentlemen to pass some uh, baskets for your voluntary contribution to our lectureship. It takes about $30,000 to put on this lectureship every year. And if you are willing to help defray the cost of that, then we would like your help. If the gentleman would go ahead and start uh, passing the, the baskets here in just a moment. We solicit any and all contributions, whether they're small or great. You don't, don't, feel, don't feel obligated to do that, but we would like for you to. If you're going to make out a check, then either make it out to the Faulkner Lectures or Lectureship. Just let us know that that is why you're giving and so it will go into the right place but any support that you can give would be very very much appreciated we have of course more in store tomorrow uh, we are through with the lectureship portion except for the chapel uh, speech tomorrow that will be delivered by Philip Hines is God relative but in HP 108, from 9 a.m. through the afternoon, through the uh, 3.30 session tomorrow, the Jones School of Law will be conducting a church and law seminar. For the Melvin Ote has organized this, and it's always these uh, seminars that we have on Thursday of the lectureship week are always very profitable, and especially this year's for elders, preachers, deacons, all concerned church members. Melvin is going to be speaking on safety, security, and guns in churches. Very hot issue right now among us. And then at 11 a.m., Gerald Jones, update on LGBTQ issues for churches. 1.30, John Cockleman, pitfalls of copyright laws for churches. 2.30, Lane Keel, legal challenges for Christian education. And 3.30, Rob McFarlane, Safety, Security, and Best Practices in Children's Ministries. I hope that you'll take advantage of that program tomorrow. It's a very good one, it looks like, and uh, you will want to get that information uh, for you and for the congregation where you are. By the way, we have the sheets to order the CD in the foyer and are also at the, at the uh, uh, Bible building. And if you're interested in purchasing one, you can fill that sheet out and send it in by, by mail, or you can contact uh, uh, Ra, uh, Mike McCool by email, or you can go to the website and order it. It's $25 per CD, and as I've said before, it's worth every penny that you pay for it. Because not only do you get our lectureship, you also have, have access to the entire library of lectures at BibleLectureship.com until December of this year. As we say in Lamar County, Alabama, you can't beat that with a stick. Several lectureships 
are included in the CD. Several lectureships on the website. We encourage you to take advantage of that. By the way, before I forget, next year's lectures is going to be March 3rd through the 7th. Mark the date in your calendar, March 3rd through the 7th. And the theme will be Restore, Seeking God's Way. We're excited about that program. We're going to have a number of outstanding speakers to come in from both here locally and also outside our area to talk about that theme, that great theme of Restore. And I hope that you will decide to be a part of that next year. I can't think of anything else to say, and that's something for me. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to have a dismissal song, and then we'll be led in our dismissal prayer by Brother Fenner Northern. Would you please stand? Let us sing. Sing the wondrous love. together please <clears throat> almighty God we look forward to the time that we will see each other in heaven help us to see this good lectureship tonight in this service we're having now and the great lesson that we have just heard from our brother be a prologue to what we shall see how happy we are that we can come together as brothers and sisters who will one day through faith and grace be in heaven with thee and with the saved of all the earth. We're thankful for this lectureship that has been had for those who have supported it, for every speaker, and we pray that those who will be journeying home will have a safe journey. We're thankful for this service tonight. Help us to be lifted up as never before in spirit and in truth to be better servants in thy kingdom. Pardon us of our sins. Bless us on the way home. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.